Hello everyone, welcome back to Microsoft Flight Sim, where we can now fly an Ornithopter from Dune. This is available through the marketplace for free, it's about 11 gigabytes, and it contains the terrain and of course the Ornithopter itself. Included are three tutorials, five touch and go challenges, and then one big challenge, which we'll get to in this video. I won't go through the three tutorials, though I do suggest you do them. Uh, they provide very essential information as far as flying the Ornithopter is concerned. And I also suggest you set up your controls by typing Orny in the search field and getting those. Uh, you need to set up the afterburner and the other uh, top four that we have listed there. And so I map them to my joystick, well, my throttle quadrant, actually. And we'll get to the functionality of it. Glide is to be powerless and have the wings optimized for glide. There's a dive mode that helps you plunge down and folds the wings very quickly. And the afterburner is just to give you a boost. So we've got the five challenges here and then the one rescue mission, which is the tough one. And so I set about doing first a desert run and I go through all five trying to set good times for them. And so it is saying times, but it's a touch and go challenge. So we have to land on these platforms that they have here. So you can see the landing pad indicated. And the trick is the Ornithopter can go horizontally at about 450 knots, but with the afterburner it can boost to faster than that. And if you're in a dive, it can go faster than that even. And so the key is slowing down and it does have very good brakes and it'll stop you dead in the air. Uh, so that's handy. It's probably the easiest thing to come to a vertical landing in. Though I thunk it every time because I'm trying to go fast here. Uh, this is not the first time I did this particular challenge. This is the one that I got the best time on. So uh, assume that I have done a few attempts before this where I crashed a few times and uh, went the wrong way and stuff like that. And I realized that we really need to just get onto those platforms and get off of them as quickly as possible and I sort of optimize how heavily I can thunk into the platforms. So yeah, the landing pads. So yeah, it's going to be rough landings all the way through these challenges, but that's the optimal way to go. If you land too slowly, of course you're wasting time. Throughout all these challenges, these time trials, I am using the afterburner judiciously or trying to because actually it can run out during one of these. I actually had it run out on me, so we're talking about two minutes worth of afterburner sort of thing. And it's actually 50 gallons of afterburner fuel, and then the main fuel tank is 450 gallons. And really, Dorney thought it doesn't look like it could carry that much, but it does apparently. So we have plenty of fuel, and it actually has plenty of range. On the exterior view, you have all the instruments, and you can see my afterburners actually run out here. Uh, so that's a little bit of a shame, but we will proceed anyway, trying to make the best speed as we can. Basically, the afterburner can get you to 500, 450 to 500 knots. Without it, it struggles. It, it goes above 300 here, but in free flight, and you can fly this in uh, around Earth too. So don't worry, you can go around anywhere with it. You can't actually fly around June in free flight though, but in free flight around Earth I go 450 without the afterburner. So here we go, landing, and this is the final pad. There we go. So 231 it said, and I made some mistakes apparently, and I was slower than the ghost plane, I think, or something like that. Well, it was plus 11 for some reason. Anyway, you can see the world top 10 there. I forgot to check my own rank here, but actually I'm playing this fairly early on. So I get fairly good ranks as far as the world ranks are concerned, but I suppose once other people get a chance to try it out, my rank will diminish. But next up is this race to Arakeen. We don't actually get to go all the way to Arakeen itself, unfortunately. It's just a model in the distance, you know how it is, like Camelot. But anyway, here's how this time trial or challenge looks. This one is a longer distance one, but not too long. These challenges are all two to three minutes. Well, okay, depending on how long you actually take, of course. Uh, but for me, they were two to three minutes. And some people did it a little bit faster. So as we come along here, uh, the question is whether you want to dive here or not. And diving involves folding the wings up and going fast like that so minimizing drag, but 
I decided not to do it there. It's not worth it on such a small height because you have to obviously unfurl the wings again to or extend the wings in order to make sure that you can fly. Uh, here we go. But you can see how easy it is to get this to make a pinpoint landing. And so that's really handy. Really, uh, as far as real planes are concerned, I'd say the F-35B uh, from Indy Fox Tech is the best to tour around in and uh, check out the sights with because it can go very fast between different points, but also hover. Uh, but as far as fictional craft are concerned, the Ornithopter is probably the best for sightseeing because 450 knots is pretty good and it does that at low altitudes. Uh, it actually isn't very good at high altitudes because of the way it flies, right? It flaps its wings. There's not much to work with at high altitude. And so it's very slow at high altitude, even though it can go up to 30,000 feet. It's very slow up there. It's fastest at low altitude, and that's good for sightseeing, obviously. But it can also come to a standstill. Eventually, I will take it into free flight at the end of this video. And when I do the free flight and we fly around uh, New York City, uh, you'll see me try all this stuff out and yeah it's really really good for sightseeing because you can come to a very effective hover and take a look at things so there's the final spot that we have to get to it's all about slamming into these landing pads and then taking off again but slowing down is tough because you're slowing down from 450 knots or more and trying to get that right can be tricky sometimes there I'm right on the edge, and occasionally I hit the edge of it and then tip backwards and fall off and crash. So that's been a problem. As far as A, B, and C for the rankings are concerned, I don't know what the criteria is. I mean, here uh, the top one was 2 minutes and 2 seconds, I was 2 minutes 20. Uh, I didn't think I did that badly, but anyway, uh, there I was at rank 40. But again, this is early on, so yeah. I assume that people will fill that in by quite a lot, but still, I, I think they're being unfair about where they put A, B, and C. I wonder if they playtested it properly uh, to determine what the rankings should be for what time, or whether they just randomly made it up. I don't know. Anyway, I, I was peeved about getting C's all the time, basically. Anyway, as you can see, the other one was a C as well. So here's Mountain Dive, and as it says, this one, we're, it, the intention is to make us do a dive and build up speed by folding up the wings, though that is, of course, potentially dangerous. So here we go. The other ornithopter is the ghost, right? So it's the indicator of either the average or what I did before. So here we go, and unfortunately the interior of the Ornithopter doesn't really help you as far as knowing anything. Uh, how fast you're going, where you're going, what your altitude is, uh, the instrumentation is abysmal. Uh, fortunately I have uh, a stream deck and I was outputting the information from, ouch, <laughs> that was abnormally hard, uh, outputting the information from Flight Sim onto the stream deck so I could see my velocity and stuff like that. Of course, uh, you might want to just use the exter uh, external view, and with the external view you can see all the stuff uh, with the instrumentation displayed. And th that's probably what they were intending us to do, but I do like flying in the cockpit. Uh, when we do the sightseeing bit later on, I'll do more exterior views of the ornithopter. And really, this sort of uh, not coming to a complete stop before hitting the landing pad is probably the optimal way to go. In order to take off with the Ornithopter, uh, the best thing to do is not only to put your throttle all the way up, but then push the afterburner, which will give you a forward boost. Otherwise, it'll go vertically up, and then you'll lose time because you're going vertically up very slowly. Pushing the afterburner is basically a uh, jet-assisted takeoff. Uh, you're just firing the afterburner horizontally instead of vertically and that horizontal boost ensures that you go into horizontal flight sooner. So here we are getting to the final spot and I barely make the edge there without falling off. 146. Yes, more practice with the wing break. That's a B, apparently. Again, I don't know what the criteria is, but uh, so what we have in this 
you can see 129 was the best there and I was ranked 28 at the time and I was satisfied with that it's okay uh, moving right along hole in the rock was next and this was much more challenging as far as maneuvering was concerned also just plain finding my way but you can see the top time was 2 minutes and 24 seconds the ghost was at 3 minutes and 19 seconds so that presumably would be the current average or something like that and once again this is not like my first attempt this was the best attempt out of say 3 or 4 uh, I think for each of these, I tried it about three or four times. Now here I'm slowing down way early here. And it's always rough on the thud. Uh, in free flight, I will definitely be kinder to it. It's only because of these challenges that I'm flying it that way. So, this is a nice canyon, isn't it? I uh, wish the Grand Canyon would look like this, but though speaking of places that you would like to fly this in, it doesn't actually, it's not as maneuverable as you might like. There are plenty of planes that are more maneuverable than this. Because of the way it flies, it's a little bit rough. But part of that is just the sheer speed of it. Right, something slower would be easier to maneuver. This is... It may or may not look like it, but I'm going more or less 400 knots or more. And then here we folded up the wings to dive, and then extending the wings again, that's that sound. And then cruising right along. It does encourage you to use ground effect with this. That apparently helps. And here we have to sit down on this pad, but this is not the final pad. Uh, still slowing down a little bit early, but it's better to do that. I also overshot the pads a few times, so when I did that, obviously I was more cautious the second time around. The checkpoint there and then the final. Sometimes I got confused by the little waypoint markers. Saw one but not the other, or didn't see anything. But here we go final little bit. Here it's a judgment call whether you want to plunge down by folding the wings on that. It's a pretty quick thing and I don't think I got that much extra speed out of that. This is the sort of thing that you probably want to fly just by the feel of it. So I guess maybe the lack of instrumentation is good kind of thing. Maybe. That could be an inter interpretation of what they've done with the interior, though maybe there'll be a mod for this that will actually give us usable instruments. Could be nice. Okay, so that one is completed. And again, see. Uh, 2 minutes and 46 seconds, and where does that get me? I'm not super competitive. I'm just mildly competitive. Anyway, number 26 there. And so that leaves us with the final mission, and that's Canyon Rush, which is in the dark, and is much tighter. So the Red Chasm, best actually beat 2 minutes, which is impressive. The Ghost is at 2 minutes and 58 seconds. So yep, a narrow gorge here. The buzz of the wings is interesting and sort of nice. Okay, and... Touch out. <laughs> it's just like that, it's just like that. That's how you're gonna have to do it, trust me. I did all these challenges during the live stream and somebody suggested that maybe they uh, deducted points for the rough landings and that's why I got seized but I don't think so I think it's just a straight time and that there's a time that you get an A4 a time that you get a B4 and a time that you get a C4 otherwise they'd tell you that they're deducting points for rough landings 
Um, and as long as they're not de deducting points for rough landings, it's definitely optimal to land as roughly as possible. Or as quick as possible. Here, I had trouble finding my way. I crashed a few times trying to figure out where the heck I was supposed to turn in that place. And so this is the product of some exploration ahead of time. It's unfortunate that they don't have this available for us to just flee, free roam in. Uh, they could have given us an extra section where we could just free roam, except they would block off the edges of it. They could just... I don't know if they'd need to stitch all these challenges together or whether it is already one whole map. I hope it's all one whole map. But they could just have the invisible wall thing at the edge of it. And uh, but The challenges as they are already have invisible walls in them. Quite strict invisible walls, mind you. Uh, the, you know, if you stray away from the intended path, you get worn fairly quickly. But yeah, I, it would be nice to be able to free roam around what they've designed here if it can be stitched together into a single map, or if it already is. Okay, here, I was getting tired, so normally I wouldn't accept the back on track, I would restart at that point, but it, it had been a while, so I decided to just accept the back on track on this one. This being the last of the challenges, the touch and go challenges. And there's the final marker. So I just decided to get on with it and complete it. Uh, having trouble landing. Yeah, that's taking a long time. See, if you try and do it gentle, it takes a long time. You can use the afterburner for more than just takeoffs, contrary to what that guy said. Anyway, way later than 159, which is the best, 249 and 47th in the rankings. Again, soon to be ousted. And then this rescue mission, this Coriolis Storm Escape. Basically, you have to rescue a person. I have a problem. I've lost the engines. I'm gonna make an emergency landing. So they're making an emergency landing right in front of a sandstorm. I need immediate extraction. I'm northwest of your position. I have no idea how he determines that he's northwest of my position. Uh, I guess he has a radar that actually works. But you can tell that you're going northwest by whether it's green up there in the objectives. There's, I don't know if there's a functional compass on the dashboard, but of course you can go to an external view and get you're heading, I think. I think it's available there. But uh, yeah, I just, I, I knew how to get there by having failed a few times. Land so there we go. The this is the best attempt, but I'll tell you right now, I failed. Um, and it was the most difficult thing and I'll have to try again later, but this is not going to work out for me. And part of it was I was just too tired after doing all the other challenges. So, and I was really tired of seeing him run so slowly. Okay, so we retrieve the pilot. If you actually get into the sandstorm, you die. So it's insta-death there. Which is sad, but, you know. So, here we go. Going into the canyon. This is the worst escape route ever. Like, it'd be better to just go somewhere else. <laughs> Any, anywhere else. I'm not convinced that this was the best escape route. But it is a challenge and it's a difficult one. This is much tighter than the even the nighttime one that we did. And your wings are unexpectedly broad. And that's something you'll find out. Probably don't appreciate how broad they are unless you're doing all this stuff in external view. So I managed to get through some fairly tight turns here at reasonably high speeds. I'm not too sure how slow we can go and still make it. Going slow would certainly help, but here I just made a wrong turn. I should have turned left, but there weren't exactly like turn signs in front of me. So 
Anyway, I had had enough of the challenges at that point, so I decided to turn to free flight and fly from Washington DC to Boston on the bet that this would be a very scenic flight and see what kind of performance we got here. So we're taking off from Andrews Air Force Base or Joint Base Andrews and what I was most interested in was the range of the Ornithopter in free flight and it specifies 1700 nautical miles and I will say it, it does probably get 1700 nautical miles. I obviously didn't go the full 1700 but while I was doing a very windy flight following highways it seemed to be consuming fuel in a way that was matching a 1700 nautical mile range at low altitude. Mostly when you think of the maximum range of a plane you're thinking about in high altitude but this is actually most efficient at low altitude and that's because of the way it flies. So here we're passing by Baltimore which is a photogrammetry city and ultimately I make my way over to New York City. Uh, this is the exterior view of our ornithopter lying around. Well, we're a little bit high here because I was shifted to external view to take a backward view of Baltimore. Uh, here I am regaining the interstate, Interstate 95, which I was following. And I did crash once along the way, and that was, again, by misestimating the, the wingspan. And otherwise, it was a fairly smooth, well, not very smooth, a very windy flight because of the way I was flying it uh, between Washington, D.C. and New York City. And here we're over Newark International, Newark International, and passing by the Statue of Liberty here. Very nice. Not as blue as I was expecting it to be, but I guess that's the lighting. There's Ellis Island. And from the sound of the pilot panting, breathing heavily, I am definitely pulling a few G's here and there. And so, a very nice, pleasant flight above New York City. Ultimately, uh, over Connecticut, the game froze. So it was definitely peeved at me uh, flying so fast uh, over such intense scenery. But at least I got this part down. Very nice look. And ultimately, I decided to test out its ability to hover over New York City. So here we're flying around and then I'll sort of come to a stop and try out its ability to act like a helicopter basically. It's not a super duper helicopter and of course the fact that it's so easy to land sort of makes it less challenging than some of the helicopters. Uh, but its ability to go 450 knots and have a 1700 nautical mile range is very attractive too. So. Then again, it's a fictional craft, so you have, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of trade-offs, but it's a nifty little thing. And here I am, uh, coming to a stop here, appreciating the view, and just slowly meandering around. And yeah, definitely good for sightseeing, if you're willing to fly a plane, well, uh, a craft that is not exactly real. They should give us broomsticks or something, you know, <laughs> or there's plenty of fictional craft that are out there except for the Halo Pelican and this and Dark Star. Just saying. I could think of a few tie-ins, but I guess we have to wait until there's a movie out or something. Oh well. Okay, anyway, so I move on from this, passing by the MetLife building there, and I decide to go high and see how it performs higher up. I didn't know for sure, I had a guess, but um, it seemed like a low altitude optimized thing. I mean, when you take a look at Dune, they're hovering above the ground, they're not going high up for some reason. Uh, but here, it can go to 30,000 feet. It goes like at about 70 knots at 30,000 feet. It's not very fast. That without using the afterburner, of course. So you can't do too much when you get up there, but you can plunge into the ground. Of course, you can go into dive mode, and that's what dive mode looks like. And I got up to 700 knots plunging into the ground before I recovered. And with this view of me diving and then recovering, I'll wrap it up here. And I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please do leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.